Hello and welcome to Geek History Lesson. I'm Jason Ghostbustin Inman. I am Ashley Victoria Robinson and welcome to your Mind University because you have spookily stumbled on to the Paranormal Podcast where we will take one character, construct, or apparition from popular culture and teach you everything that you need to know about it in the case of an hour. And because we have an extra, extra creepy movie coming out, we thought we'd tell you a little bit about the Ghostbusters. And we'll allow you to interpret creepy however you like. Ooh. That's that's the kind of school we are here. Um, I want you to first off know that this lesson on the Ghostbusters, because there's that new movie coming out, mm-hmm. was suggested by Sam Martinez. So Sam Martinez is our ghost busting pal today. Thank you for Ooh. suggesting the lesson on the Ghostbusters, man. Um, Spooky Sam. Now this is going to be a little bit different than some of our other lessons. You know, different you, you say? I do say different because you know sometimes most of the time we just do a character mm-hmm. and we break down the history of the character. Mm-hmm. Well, this Ghostbusters. Shemeggy. <laughs> <laughs> it is two movies, two cartoons. We have a new movie coming up and a new cartoon and a whole smattering of comic books. So we're just sticking to like some of the behind the scenes and some of the combinations of different things and what different franchises or aspects of the Ghostbusters franchise did with certain characters um, instead of just like beat for beat telling you what happened because the first Ghostbusters movie is I think a great movie and I think you should just go watch it. Would you call it a modern classic? I would call it a modern comedy classic and that's going to send us right into the first section of our podcast about the Ghostbusters our 10 cent origin. Yes and the 10 cent origin is the part of the podcast where we give you all the basic constructs, creators and affiliations in case you ever go to a rockin' cocktail party and someone's like yo what's up with them Ghostbusters bro? No it's when they say who you gonna call? And you go, the police? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Okay, so the Tencent origin of the Ghostbusters is going to start with the first movie because that's where the Ghostbusters started. They originated in the first movie in 1984 called Ghostbusters. That's a very fair and logical choice. Uh, Directed by Ivan Reitman, produced by Ivan Reitman, written by Dan Aykroyd, Harold Harold Ramis, and even though he's not credited in the official credits, Ivan Reitman also co-wrote it. Uh, Ah. So there were three writers. Starred Bill Murray, Dan Aykroyd, Sigourney Weaver, Harold Ramis, and Rick Moranis, and also Ernie Hudson. Yes. Uh, music by Elmer Bernstein. Uh, cinematography by Laszlo Kovacs. Is edited by David Blewett uh, and Sheldon Kahn. Um, and then it was released by Columbia Pictures on June 8th of 1984. The running time is 105 minutes, so it's a shorter, it's not a two-hour movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, of course, its budget was $30 million. Oh, so a micro budget by our current standards. And the box office domestic poll was $295 million. So it no easily it got a sequel. Easily surpassed. So let's move <laughs> right into the meet cute section of our podcast. And the meet cute is a term that we stole from romantic comedy writing, where we tell you where we first met these characters and how cute it was. Ashley, where did you first meet the Ghostbusters? I think I know the answer to this question. Well, that's sort of a complicated question because I didn't see the Ghostbusters original movie until last year okay. uh, at uh, Jason Inman's behest. Oh, yeah. It was a uh, it was an official decree from the Mind University that I, I should watch it. I think it was during Halloween. I believe it was during Halloween. Um, I know that I must have watched the cartoon, The Real Ghostbusters, as a child, although I don't have any distinct memories, Mm -hmm. because we had the Egon toy. Inexplicably, the weird blonde one. But that was the only one. Spaghetti hair. Yeah, we didn't have any of the, but we had like a really crummy Egon toy. So I'm assuming I met them as a child, but I really only remember meeting them last year for the first time. Uh How about you? Where did you first meet cute, the various Ghostbusters? Um, I don't remember when I saw the first Ghostbusters movie, Mm -hmm. but I do remember watching the cartoon like crazy. Nice. And I remember getting the Ghostbusters uh, proton pack from the real Ghostbusters. That was the cartoon. Yes. Uh, It had a little foam yellow uh, uh, proton stream, had a little trigger. You go, meow, meow. Meow, meow. And it had a little hook for the trap. I never had the trap. Uh, but I had all four of the Ghostbuster toys mm-hmm. with their little proton streams that you just like twisted and yeah. like shook it. <laughs> yeah. like that. They're was, very sad. <laughs> n- they're not sad. Those were awesome. Get out of here. Um, <laughs> but I never had the Ghostbusters trap. And I had a stuffed Stay Puff Marshmallow Man from the real Ghostbusters that I slept with. And, and I still got it. And everybody on the internet just fell in love with you. That's fine. <laughs> and I still have it. Uh, it be- and I'm glad that I still have it because apparently on eBay it's worth like a hundred bucks. Is it really? Yep. Now I also have another meet cute that I wanted to say in this that I have actually met one of the Ghostbusters. What? 
I, I once met Dan Aykroyd in a bar in Los Angeles once. <laughs> and instead of like going up there and being like, oh man, you're so funny for Saturday Night Live, da 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 da, the comment that I said to him mm-hmm. is I told him that I loved the script for Ghostbusters. Well said. And he shook my hand and he bought me a shot because he said no one ever tells him that. Really? Yeah. Well done. Yeah, yeah. So I, uh, so I, Dan Aykroyd once bought me a shot. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he was lovely, which is good. He was very nice. I didn't talk to him very long. I didn't want to bother him because, mm-hmm. you know, he's a legend. Um, and he was sitting at the bar and he was by himself. Mm-hmm. And then I didn't really want to. I was there with some other friends. And I was like, I, I'm going to tell uh, Dan Aykroyd how smartly written I think Ghostbusters is because it is so well written. And he bought me a shot for it. So there you go, friends. If you ever see people you like, there's the lesson to be learned. Say D- something clever. <laughs> say something clever. And, and just be nice and leave them alone act like a normal person yeah you know don't don't geek out and be awkward and do the stuff because then it gets weird bonus lesson from your mind university there you go now we're gonna yeah (laughs) now we're gonna move into the history 101 of the ghostbusters yes the main meat of the lesson where professor jason is going to take you through the entire history of the ghostbusters that's how you're gonna start the lesson okay that's the ghostbusters song i know do you know what the uh the real ghostbusters cartoon theme song sounds like no. You ready? Dee, 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 no, 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 no. <laughs> da, 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 da. <laughs> it's, a, it's the song. It's the song. Okay, I so. thought it was the song. <laughs> Don't make fun of me. All right, here we go. We're gonna we're gonna start combining some Ghostbuster histories uh, right here. But we're gonna start out with the movies, mm-hmm. and then we'll talk about the cartoons. But instead of just telling you what, again what's gonna happen in the movie, I want to tell you about what went into making the first Ghostbusters movie because I think it's quite fascinating. Cool. Uh, Ashley, did you know that Dan Aykroyd's family really loves ghosts? Um, I had heard something like that, but I don't know any details about it. Well, let me tell you. Dan Aykroyd's great-grandfather was a renowned spiritualist. Stop Um, it. And his family had (laughs) their own regular medium to channel souls from the other side. So Dan Aykroyd is actually a Ghostbuster, is what you're saying? It's it's in his family lineage, because get ready. Okay. <laughs> his grandfather, a telephone engineer, investigated the possibility of contacting the dead via radio technology. Awesome. And his father authored a well-regarded history of ghosts. <laughs> Uh, yeah. So his father wrote a book about the history of ghosts. That's amazing. So ghost busting is in Dan Aykroyd's family lineage. I just want to imagine that like all the characters in that are just people that he's related to. Like they're his weird uncles and like one of them is his dad. That's so be, funny. Um, now Dan Aykroyd's original idea for Ghostbusters was that he came up with the idea about how to trap ghosts. Mm-hmm. And when he came up with that idea, he wanted to marry it to the old ghost films of the 1930s. Uh, Dan Dan Aykroyd says, and I quote, virtually every comedy team did a ghost movie, Abbott and Costello, Bob Hope, Don Knotts, and I was a big fan of all of them. And so because of that original idea of trapping the ghost, he began hammering out a screenplay. Nice. Now, in the original story, written by Dan Aykroyd at this point, Mm -hmm. really different from the Ghostbusters movie. Okay. (laughs) In the original version, a group called the Ghost Smashers... Oh, man. They, That's what the cartoon should have been. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they travel through time, space, and other dimensions combating huge ghosts. Uh, in this original script, by the way, one of the original ghosts they fight, Stay Puft Marshmallow Man. Oh, so uh, Stay Puft was there from the beginning? Stay Puft was there from the beginning from Dan Aykroyd. Awesome. Uh, these ghost smashers wore SWAT-like outfits, and they used wands instead of proton packs to fight mm. the ghosts. Now, um, some of the storyboards were drawn from this original oh, script. Oh, really? And they also have them wearing, like, the riot gear helmets, and they have, like, visors and stuff like that. So Dan Aykroyd pitched uh, his story of Ghost Smashers to director-producer Ivan Reitman, mm-hmm. who liked the basic idea, but then thought it would be way too expensive to film. So they began to change the script, and eventually it moved into ghost busting. Yeah, this is how Hollywood works, guys. Yep. <laughs> uh, now, originally, the movie was written for John Belushi of mm-hmm. Saturday Night Live, yes. uh, one of the Blues Brothers, as the lead. And Dan Aykroyd says, I was writing a line for John in the script when... His talent manager and eventual Ghostbusters executive producer, Bernie Brillstein, called me and told me that they found him dead. That is very sad, but also kind of nice. Well, it's also kind of nice, too, because John Belushi is in Ghostbusters in a way. He is. Because Slimer the Ghost, the big green fat glob of the Jabba Hutt ghost, um, 
is based on John Belushi and is supposed to represent John Belushi. And he is one of the only Ghostbusters characters that has transcended all of the incarnations in every medium. Yes. So that's yes, he, yes. he's one of the biggest parts of the legacy. So that's really nice. So there you go. It started with John Belushi and John Belushi is still there. Heck yeah. Um, the production soon turned to Bill Murray for the role and he was given a half finished screenplay. <laughs> that's bad news, yep. man. <laughs> Eventually, the team brought on the late Harold Ramis, uh, dr- director of Caddyshack. Mm-hmm. Uh, he also became the third co writer and the third Ghostbuster eventually. Um, but the fact that the script needed massive reconstruction surgery didn't prevent the team from pitching it to Columbia Pictures. Now, they pitched it to Frank Price. He was the chairman of Columbia Pictures at the time. Mm-hmm. And um, Ovitz was the representation of Reitman and Ramis. Mm-hmm. Um, and he pitched the product to Frank Price as, as this. And he's quoted as, we have a project. Danny Ritten, Ivan directing, Bill Murray attached, and we're bringing in Harold Remus. And Frank, the chairman, said, how much do you think it'll cost? And Ivan Reitman said, $25 million. And the chairman said, I'll do it. Wow. Now, Reitman has later said in later years that he conjured the figure out of thin air. <laughs> And he said, he said, because he had at the time had directed and made Stripes, this yes. Bill Murray movie uh, comedy. By the way, great, funny movie. You should see it. John Candy, great. Nice. Um, and so what he did is he just tripled Stripes' budget. And he was like, ah, oh, tripled Stripes sounds good. You know, for all these special effects and stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, they wound up with 30 when they asked for 25. They eventually got to 30 million. That's not yep. a bad get. Still now, hardly any money to make a supernatural. Sorry. Exactly. <laughs> uh, now the chairman slated Ghostbusters. For a major 1984 summer release, mm-hmm. giving Reitman and the production team one year to finish writing, shoot it, and edit a big budget, big special effects comedy film. In fact, the biggest film that anybody involved with the movie had ever done. And, and for anybody who doesn't know, if you're still writing a script from that time into when it's going to go to production, is to release you, is you yes release yeah. my mistake is somewhere between oh. Three to five years. Sometimes, if you're if you're moving quickly, yeah. Well, sometimes two years. So yeah, yeah. Sometimes two. But I was nowadays. I was going to say for the effects budget, it's be a little yeah. higher. But the crazy thing about it is, he's like, we think about Bill Murray, we think about Dan Aykroyd, we think about Ivan Reitman as these like huge superstars. Figures. Yeah, they were not superstars. This Ghost, is, this is what Ghostbusters made them. made them the superstar. Um, I have heard them uh, talking about how they all came together for this production, and most of them had worked in theater before. Well, they had all been uh, Second City. Yes. Improv. Yes. Like that. Uh, and we, there is a lot of improv in Ghostbusters, and we'll get to some of that. Cool. Um, the first order of business of this movie was to rework the now iconic main characters, who relatively were undifferentiated in early drafts of the script. Sure. Um, Dan Aykroyd had the idea of pulling from Hollywood archetypes and and and, and trios. Mm-hmm. And he had the idea of making Peter Venkman, Raymond Stance, and Egon Spengler the Scarecrow, the Lion, and the Tin Man. Oh, my God. Yeah. You're blowing my mind. Yeah, right? Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm like... Yeah. <laughs> they are. They are. That totally P- makes sense. Bankman is a scarecrow, yeah. Raymond is the lion, and Egon's the tin man. And it totally fits. Ah, oh, I just have a whole new appreciation for that yep. Ghostbusters movie now. <laughs> <laughs> they also gutted most of Dan Aykroyd's Ghost Smasher script. Um, for, exa- for, for example, in the Ghost Smasher script, mm-hmm. it is called for an illicitly operated spectral storage facility <laughs> that is in a deserted... <laughs> This is how specific he went. Okay. It was in a deserted Sunoco gas station somewhere in New Jersey. All right. And he put it there because he thought it was a punishing purgatory for captured ghosts. New Jersey, an abandoned gas, gas station, station in, in New, New Jersey. Jersey. I'm sorry, all listeners <laughs> from New Jersey. <laughs> um, instead, they decided to change it to an in-house storage facility in the Ghostbusters Firehouse headquarters. Um, the shooting script also called for a shot desp- depicting the inside of a unholy makeshift asylum with its tenants being the moping spirits of the famous dead people. But ultimately they decided that was too expensive as well and they cut it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, The team also faced a challenge right from the start. The new Ghostbusters script, the reworked Ghostbusters script, was right then calling for 200 special effects. And at the time, all special effects facilities were tied up with other projects, Mm -hmm. including... Indiana Jones, The Temple of Doom, and Return of the Jedi. Uh Uh-huh. So Ivan Reitman proposed a different solution. Okay, what did he propose? He said, let's just build our own special effects house. 
Right, because we got the time and the cash yeah, right? to do that. I admire, I admire the gumption mm-hmm. in, in 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 having that be your alternative. That's a terrible idea. Real ter- in less than a year. Yeah, it's a ter- I mean, clearly it worked out, but that's a terrible idea. Well, they got Oscar-winning effects man Richard Edlund. He's nice. famous for his work on the Star Wars films, Raiders of the Lost Ark, Poltergeist, mm-hmm. um, and then they eventually finished their third draft of the film. And they set about to cast. Mm -hmm. Um, The script was making its way around Hollywood, and it caught the attention of Sigourney Weaver. Ah. Yep. Uh, But she still had to audition for the part, even though she already had Alien by this point. Really? They didn't just look at her and they were like, you can have this part. Um, (laughs) She said that in her audition, she's quoted as that she decided to do her best rendition of a terror dog. Because if you remember, remember there's a creature that possesses Dana Barrett, her character, and turns her into a dog in the climax of the film. So she says, and I quote, in the audition... I remember starting to growl and bark and gnaw on the cushions and start jumping around. (laughs) (laughs) Just imagine that. Sigourney Weaver. (laughs) It's funny because I really think of her as like a kind of a stately woman with a lot of dignity and beauty. So imagine somewhere in a room in 1983, uh, Sigourney Weaver was like. (laughs) I would cast her. All right. (laughs) Ivan Reitman cut the tape and said, don't ever do that again. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I'm sorry. That's amazing. Um, oh, man. Now we're going to talk about Winston Zedmore, the fourth Ghostbuster. Yes. Now, originally Eddie Murphy was considered, but the role eventually went to Ernie Hudson. Mm-hmm. Now, according to Ernie Hudson, an earlier version of the script had his character Winston in a larger role with an elaborate backstory as an Air Force demolitions expert. Ooh. Now, Ernie was super excited by this part, and he agreed to take the part for half his, for half his usual salary mm-hmm. to help the budget. The night before shooting began, he was given a new script with a greatly reduced role. According to him, I could not find any confirmation of this anywhere else um, because Reitman told him that the studio wanted to expand uh, Murray's role. Right. The so, white guy. <laughs> again, I have no confirmation of this besides an interview with Ernie Hudson. Possibly anachronistic, but interesting if true. There you go. Uh, Reitman uh, then went to cast uh, Louis Tully, mm-hmm. the account, the future accountant of the Ghostbusters and also the other uh, Dana's neighbor who becomes a dog. Yes. Um, originally, the character was conceived for comedian John Candy, very famous uh, from Spaceballs. Oh. Who Reitman had directed in Stripes, and early storyboards for the film depict depict excuse me John Candy. Mm-hmm. Uh, Reitman says that when he showed John Candy the script, John Candy said, uh, "I don't know about this. I could do it. Maybe I should do it with a German accent." What? And which immediately made Ivan Reitman be like, uh, nah, we're going to give it to somebody else, John. Thanks. Yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, which the part eventually went to uh, uh, Rick Moranis. Mm-hmm. So, Reitman then set about to start shooting the movie, which he began to call his New York movie. His New York yep. movie. <laughs> and thus, uh, shooting soon began... On Ghostbusters. One day, uh, the team drove all over the city when they were shooting the Ghostbusters guerrilla style at different iconic locations in uh, New York City. They soon found out that Rockefeller Center is privately owned. It sure is. Yep, which they didn't know. And in one scene in the final cut of the movie, a security guard in the background runs after Murray, Ramis, and Aykroyd by Rockefeller Center. That is a real security guard chasing the real actors away. It is in the final cut of the movie. That is amazing. I knew I didn't know that story, but I knew that they did not get all the permits that you were supposed to because New York is much yes. like Los Angeles. You need a permit to shoot anyway. Very expensive. Very expensive. Yeah, yes. And that's how you keep your budget down, folks. And soon for Ghostbusters, there became a big snafu that almost threatened the entire production. What was that? Well, the team soon discovered that back in the mid 1970s, there was a children's show called The Ghost Space Busters. Oh, which created, there was no Google at the time. No Google, and which created a legal barrier for the use of the name. They were already well into shooting, and they had to create several different signs bearing the names of fictional operations to post in front of the door of the Ghostbusters Firehouse headquarters. So oh they would God. so they would do multiple shots of the car coming out or whatever, including alternate names like Ghost Stoppers, Ghost Breakers. They even went back to Ghost Smashers. Ghost Stoppers? That's yep. a terrible yep. name. Now, the issue finally came to a head 
when they shot a scene with hundreds of extras towards the end of the film mm-hmm. in Central Park West where the whole all the extras are shouting Ghostbusters 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 over and over again that's what yes. brings the team there to the building to fight uh, Stay Puft Marshmallow Man uh, producer Joe Medjick recalls that after they filmed the scene he got on a payphone called the studio in Burbank and said you guys have got to clear that damn name <laughs> Because there's no way in heck we can reshoot this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it eventually was cleared for film use. Nice. And we'll go into a little bit more of why you'll learn. That's a little bit of the reason why the cartoon is called The Real Ghostbusters. But we'll get back to that. Okay. Now, fun fact. The exterior shots of the Ghostbusters firehouse was shot outside real life New York fire station hook and ladder number eight in Tribeca. Yes. Uh, and it actually was the subject of a recent successful campaign to save it from the municipal acts. Mm-hmm. Uh, a Ghostbusters sign proudly hangs inside. Uh, the interior shots for the firehouse were filmed in Los Angeles, of course. But that firehouse is still there. It is. And if you are in New York around Halloween, they will put the Ghostbusters sign on the outside. Ooh, Fun that's fact. cool. Now, the improv uh, heavy shoot continued and wrapped in February of 1984. I want to tell you about one of the funniest improv things that for me, uh, improv scenes, uh, there is a scene where Bill Murray uh, goes over to Dana Barrett, Sigourney Weaver's apartment. Yes. And she's like, can you check it for ghosts and stuff like that because her refrigerator's been going crazy and stuff like that. And and he walks in and he has this little spectrometer or whatever or whatever and he walks around and he's sort of like tick, 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 tick. You know, he's yeah. walking around. Um, apparently the scene was supposed to like immediately go to the bedroom. Like he was just supposed to like tick, 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 tick and like go right to the bedroom. Yeah. Just like kind of showing that his character is like all about sex, right? Mm-hmm. Bill Murray, on the first take, walked over to the piano and did the, the that is in the final cut of the movie and went ding 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 ding. Yeah. Oh, the ghosts! They hate that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that is like a one piece of improv. There are many other instances you can look them up, but that for me was I thought one of the funnier ones. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so anyways, so they wrapped Ghostbusters in February of 1984, and they had four months left to edit and produce all the special effects, including holy crap, building nine full size Stay Puft Marshmallow Man suits. Nine? Nine. Because they had several of them that got destroyed when they would go up in flames during shooting the ending of the film when the Ghostbusters killed the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man. That sounds so dangerous. Yep. Like, so dangerous. Anyways, it all worked out because <laughs> the film was released and it became a huge success. And again, if you haven't seen Ghostbusters at this point, we spoiled so much of it, but here's the synopsis. Thor... F- <laughs> Thor. Three former uh, <laughs> parapsychologist professors set up shop as a unique a unique ghost removal service. That's it. That's all you need. Pretty much. Yep. Uh, now, after the movie, there was a cartoon that was made called The Real Ghostbusters, which we'll come back around to. Okay. And then we come to Ghostbusters 2. Ghostbusters 2. Which is something that you'll find out that nobody that made Ghostbusters 1 wanted to make. Interesting. Which reminds me of something else that we don't ever want to make. Okay. And that is Geek History Lesson 2. Now, what I mean by this is that kids, family members, mothers and daddies, we don't want to shut down and make a whole new podcast. We want to keep making this podcast. And we can only keep doing that if you lovely people go over to patreon.com slash Jawin, J-A-W-I-I-N, and support us over there. It's the only way that we can contain the ghosts of podcasting, like server costs and research time. And you can get perks for your support, like a Patreon-exclusive podcast. So the next time you wonder, boy... How can I help out my GHL professors? Ashley? Head on over to patreon.com slash Java, J-A-W-I-I-N, and get you some exclusive stuff. That's right. You can support the show for as little as $1 a month, and it makes a big difference, all you Stay Puft Marshmallow Mans out there. So thank you for the support. I'm really good at cues. Yep. And now (laughs) back to Ghostbusters 2. Yes. Now, the second film, Ghostbusters 2, was released in 1989. And after the success of the first film and the animated cartoon, which was still in the air at this time, Mm -hmm. uh, the real Ghostbusters, as I said, Columbia Pictures pressed the producers in the the writers to make a sequel. Okay. However, Dan Aykroyd, Harold Ramis, and Ivan Reitman were very uncomfortable with this, as the original t- film was intended to be conclusive. It, it is. It's a closed yeah. loop. And they wanted to work on other projects. But eventually they agreed, money, and, yes. they, and they created a script. 
Now, that movie is released in 1989, and the basic story is five years after saving the New York City, uh, I said the New York City like there was another one. The New York uh, City. From the demigod Gozer, the Ghostbusters uh, have gone their separate ways after having been sued by the city for property damage and barred from investigating the supernatural, forcing them out of business. They leads to the discovery of a massive river of ectoplasm underneath the city, Mm -hmm. and a resurgence of spectral activity allows the staff of the Ghostbusters to revive their business, and they use the Statue of Liberty to fight a painting. They should. Sure do. <laughs> now, Ashley, you have seen Ghostbusters 2. I have seen Ghostbusters 2. Basic thoughts. There's a baby in it, and the baby's really cute, and I hope that the baby grows up to be Chris Hemsworth. Um, it's not, it is not a worthy successor no. to the original. It, it hits, feels... Yep. It feels rushed and it feels forced. It hits a lot of the same beats of the first movie. It does, but not in a way that feels like celebratory, in a way that just feels like, well, we could just copy the script and change some stuff around. Yeah. Yeah. Not not as good as the first one. No. Uh, But did you know that there was a Ghostbusters 3? Almost. Uh, I knew that there had been murmurings of. Well, there's a script. Is it available? Uh, you can find synopses of it online, and I and I have I have pieces of synopses. There are people have reviewed the script online. I could not find it mm. because I really wanted to read what it was. Yeah, yeah. Um, if you can find it, please send it to us. <laughs> there were there were years of talks of Ghostbusters three, and Dan Aykroyd in the late nineties wrote a script called Ghostbusters three Hell Bent. Ooh, that's a great subtitle. Okay. The concept had the characters transported to an alternate version of Manhattan called Manhelton. <laughs> Less good. Where the people and places are hellish versions of the originals and where the Ghostbusters meet the devil. Now, a modified version of this script was later used in the Ghostbusters video game that they actually got all the original actors to voice. Oh, okay. I played pieces of it. It's a pretty fun game. Cool. So, uh, here's the basic kind of plot. Okay. Okay, after all these years... Uh, Ray Stance has made the Ghostbusters a full-blown corporation with dozens of employees, including mechanics that looked after a fleet of converted ambulances. Cool. Um, one scene echoes the shot of the Ecto-1 driving across the Brooklyn bi- Bridge, only this time there's several of them. And they have built themselves what they call the Ecto-50, which is a converted truck with a mobile ghost containment unit. Oh, that's a cool idea. Winston is now a doctor now, and Peter Venkman is absent from the entire movie except for a cameo at the end uh, because they say that he has run off to marry Dana. The (laughs) The movie would have introduced a new younger Ghostbusters team made up of three men and two women. So it seems like... The maybe there's some things from that that might be borrowed in the new movie. Yes, yes, uh, um, and then of course there is the modern Ghostbusters movie uh, with the all female team directed by Paul Feig, uh, Paul Feig, which is a Ruby reboot, and you can go see that for yourself in the theaters. Now on to cartoons. Cartoons. There's a there's a cartoon out there called the Real Ghostbusters. There is. Series ran from September 13th, 1986 to October 5th, 1991. Did it really run that long? It, it ran into the 90s, baby. Wow. That's right. That's how awesome it is. Good job, Real Ghostbusters. I'm impressed. Um, now, there is a comic book writer mm-hmm. out there, written some big comic books, a couple okay. of comic books I know you like. He did a run on Superman, did a run on Wonder Woman, did some independent uh, comic books for a, a certain independent company that's named after a, a, a cow. Um, and he got a start. On the real Ghostbusters. Okay. Ashley, do you have a guess about which comic book writer this is? Who got a start on the real Ghostbusters? Well, I had a guess, and then and then the Top Cow thing really threw me off, and then I felt bad. <laughs> uh, is he? Can I ask for a hint? Uh, sure, we'll see. Is he currently writing for the Top Cow? I have no idea. Uh, is it uh, is it Ron Mars? No. <laughs> um, is it Mark? Mark Celestri? Uh, no. I'm not giving you any more guesses. It was uh, <laughs> J. Michael Straczynski. Oh, curse words. J. Michael Straczynski was the story editor, and he wrote episodes for every season except for four and seven. Now, as I said earlier, the real Ghostbusters title was added because of the dispute with Filmation and the Ghost Space Busters properties, right? Yes. That's how they made them different. Um, the real Ghostbusters, uh, because Filmation actually was revamping their Ghostbusters cartoon because of the popularity of the Ghostbusters movie. Oh, they were like, let's get in on the zeitgeist. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, 
and and despite rumors to the contrary, Columbia was actually allowed to use the name Ghostbusters as one word for the cartoon. They could have just called it Ghostbusters, but Columbia decided <laughs> but. to add <laughs> the real Ghostbusters to snub filmation. Yeah, just twist that knife a little bit. <laughs> now, now, as I said, uh, this is J. Michael Straczynski before Babylon 5, mm-hmm. before Amazing Spider-Man, before Thor. Um, and before this, his biggest credit was He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. I didn't know he wrote on yep. He-Man. And he brought a lot of interesting perspectives of the show. There are some interesting storylines in the real Ghostbusters. Okay. Now, it doesn't quite hold up. There are <laughs> sure. there are pieces of it that do. But some of their plots and some of their ideas introduced in the show, I think are way, 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 way more complex than a normal kid's cartoon. Okay. Let me tell you some of this. Please. The first episode of The Real Ghostbusters is called Ghosts Are Us. Okay. And it featured a trio of escaped ghosts who set up their own rival ghost busting series service. That's a great idea. That's right? an amazing conceit for a cartoon. So the first episode of the show inverts the entire premise of the show. Yeah. So the ghosts are hunting us. Love it. Okay. So there are other stuff. Uh, just to let you know how, how this show is different. Um, it's tinkered with a little bit, but the, the finalized cartoon basically is kind of the same as the film. Mm-hmm. The Stay Puft Marshmallow Man makes numerous appearances. Well, he's really cool. Uh, in the third season of the show, Walter Peck, the redheaded guy who tries to shut down mm-hmm. the, in the very first movie, the Environmental Protection Agency guy, um, he reappears. Uh, even though the uniforms and the containment unit were redesigned and Slimer was changed from a bad ghost to a friend, um, which, by the way, those events were explained in an episode called Citizen Ghost. Citizen Ghost? Yeah, Citizen Ghost uh, it actually is an episode of the real Ghostbusters that shows you what happens to the Ghostbusters like right after the, the first movie. Mm. Um, now, Gozer is mentioned several times between the series. Now, 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 also, a quick note, this series takes place in between the two Ghostbusters movies. Right, of course, because um, it started right after yeah, the yeah, first exactly. movie. But eventually it will connect to Ghostbusters 2. It, it has little, they, they, they add like uh, 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 Tully, uh, Rick mm-hmm. Moranis' character, yeah, yeah. into the show, and they start making allusions to Ghostbusters 2. Smart. So Smart. there we go. Uh, um, but yeah, again, Gozer is mentioned several times. Uh, and in the third season, some of the character designs were modified. Ray's character was slimmed down, so he wasn't so fat. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Slimer was given a tail instead of a rounded bottom. Really? Yeah, yeah. I actually like Slimer with a tail better. I don't know if I've ever seen Slimer with a tail. Uh, go Google it, friends. You will uh, have a fun time. Wow. Uh, Maurice LaMarche. Yes. Can you explain to our audience who Maurice LaMarche is? Maurice LaMarche is a Canadian voice actor. Um, you probably know him as Brain in Pinky yep. and the Brain or the Hedonism Bot in uh, Futurama. Futurama, yeah. He's it, he's in everything, and he is the voice of Orson Welles in Ed Wood. That's right. Uh, he, is, he was the voice of Egon Spangler. I didn't know yep. that. And he described that even though the auditioners at the time did not want him to impersonate Harold Ramis, he did so and he got the part. See, smart, yep. smart man. <laughs> um, now, he did mention that one time, uh, Maurice LaMarche mentioned that supposedly Bill Murray asked why Lorenzo Music, who was the voice of Peter Venkman, mm-hmm. uh, sounded like Garfield. By the way, uh, Lorenzo Music also voiced Garfield. Garfield. Uh, um, <laughs> And it's kind of funny that later in life, Bill Murray would go on to, to voice, voice Garfield. Garfield. So there you go. Uh, so eventually, uh, Dave Coulier, uh, voice in the show, the uh, Uncle Joey from Full House. Oh, I didn't know that. Yep. Uh, he took over uh, Peter Vinkman. Ernie Hudson, Winston, was the only actor from the film who auditioned to reprise his role of Winston Zedmore. They made him audition? He didn't get the part. They gave it to Arsenio Hall. That's a dick move. Right? You have one of the Ghostbusters who's willing to do the voice, and you're just like, nah. I mean, I know Arsenio Hall was a huge deal at the time, Mm -hmm. but really? Like, really? Now, uh, at the start of the series' fourth season in 1988, the series was retitled to Slimer! Exclamation point, and the real Ghostbusters. Really? Yep. (laughs) I didn't know that. And the opening was completely redone to center around Slimer. Eventually, the episodes were expanded from their original half-hour format to last an hour, and the overall feel of the show was changed to be more youthful, with light, lighter tone and less frightening. Oh, they did the opposite of what MASH did. Yep. <laughs> now, now let's go back to before this the, the show, because when the show became Slimer and the real Ghostbusters, they kind of became silly and goofy-goofy. But before then, when it was the real Ghostbusters, mm-hmm. it did some different thing. And it really went very deep and meta and expanded the mythology considerably. Let me tell you about some of this stuff. Please. Um, in the first season... Not only do the Ghostbusters travel back in time, but they also cross into parallel dimensions. Right, like the original script. The episode, Xmas Marks the Spot. 
that sounds like a Futurama episode. Well, it asserts that the events of Charles Dickens' story, A Christmas Carol, are actually true. Oh, what a clever idea. Yes. Uh, furthermore, in the fifth season episode, It's About Time, the Ghostbusters firehouse is threatened with being torn down in the present. Mm-hmm. And the Ghostbusters randomly travel through time, end up in 1957, when the firehouse is under attack from ghosts. After thwarting the ghosts and returning to the present, the boys have seemingly created a predestination paradox f- for the firehouse is now considered a historical landmark because it was saved by some mysterious strangers back in the 50s. Nice. <laughs> I have to say, your description of these episodes are really making me want to go back and rewatch these cartoons. We we might do some of them. Uh, Because I'm I'm pretty impressed. I will say this. If you are looking to watch an episode of of, of the The real real Ghostbusters, Ghostbusters. I would recommend Citizen Ghost, Mm -hmm. which explains why Slimer is a good guy. Um, And also Xmas Marks the Spot. Cool. Which is it? Which also has a cool thing that I'm going to tell you about right now. Okay. Uh, in Xmas marks the spot. Egon has to go inside the containment machine. Okay. So we see what the containment machine looks like for the ghosts. That's cool. And it's an ethereal world with floating rock platforms connected to nothing, a true purgatory, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, Slimer goes inside with him, mm-hmm. uh, and he also goes inside the containment unit several other times um, because, you know, he's already a ghost and getting him back out is easy. Um, although there is a creepy compliancy on Slimer's part here because he's okay with all his ghostly brethren being in prison and he's okay <laughs> with doing the dirty work. So it's a little bit, it's a little bit like that Pokemon thing yeah. where like, we're just going to keep them all in these mm-hmm. balls and they're going to be slaves to us, but don't worry about it too much. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, although notably Slimer goes inside the containment machine twice to bring out the Stay Puff Marshmallow Man. Uh-huh. Because in this reality, the Ghostbusters didn't destroy the Marshmallow Man. They simply busted him and stuck him in a trap. Well, because why would you want to let a character with that good of a look go? Yeah, there you go. Also, the real Ghostbusters are the real Ghostbusters, and the movie Ghostbusters are fake Ghostbusters. Let me explain this to you. Okay. <laughs> the in-use universe explanation in the real Ghostbusters is that the reason why the real Ghostbusters and the movie Ghostbusters don't look alike. At all. <laughs> are because the films exist within the fictional world of the real Ghostbusters. Smart. And are films based on them. Smart. So, I, in case you don't understand what I'm saying here, and Ashley will appreciate this reference, <laughs> okay. think, think of the Ghostbusters movie as the published Watson Adventures of Sherlock Holmes. I do appreciate your reference. And the Ghostbusters cartoon is the actual raw source material. Love it. There you go. This is a great analogy. <laughs> well done. Excellent. Um, in another episode, uh, Take Two, which involves the movie being made about the real the Ghostbusters, yeah. Cartoon Winston uh, <laughs> believes that the names Ramus Ackroyd and Mur- Murray sound like a law firm. They kind of do. Yep. <laughs> and after a good deal of antics, the boys end up attending the premiere of the movie. And Peter <laughs> Peter Venkman complains that movie Peter looks nothing like him. That's amazing. Yep. Now, the series ended in 1991, despite having, as I said, several tie-ins to Ghostbusters 2. But that's all you kind of need to know about the real Ghostbusters. I'm pretty impressed. So Citizen Ghost and then the episode where they go inside the containment field. And basically any episode of Stay Puft Marshmallow Man is a good time. Cool. So there you go. There was also a second Ghostbusters cartoon called Extreme Ghostbusters. I remember that one. <laughs> do you really? I do. It was originally going to be called Super Ghostbusters. Super Ghostbusters. Only lasted for one season yep. in 1997. And here's the story of the Extreme Ghostbusters. Okay. Set years after the end of the real Ghostbusters, the lack of supernatural activity has put the Ghostbusters out of business. Mm-hmm. Each member has gone their separate way, except for Dr. Egon Spengler, who still lives in the firehouse to monitor the containment unit and take care of Slimer. Aww, there you go. He precious. also teaches a class uh, on the paranormal at a local college. But when ghosts start to reappear, Egon is forced to recruit his lone four students as the new Ghostbusters. They, they are... Kylie Griffin, Mm -hmm. a goth girl genius and expert in the occult. I remember her. Eduardo Rivera, a cynical Latino slacker. (laughs) Okay. Garrett Miller, a young white paraplegic athlete who uses a wheelchair. And Roland Jackson, a studious African-American machinery whiz. So a very diverse team. I'm pretty pretty impressed there, cartoon. And also they brought back Janine, the secretary, Mm -hmm. and of course Slimer. Now, they say that the show failed because of bad scheduling. And it, the show is mostly ignored except for the character of Kylie Griffin, mm-hmm. 
who appears in the IDW Ghostbuster comic books. I did not know that. Yep. Now, uh, if you don't know, that's all for the cartoons. Mm-hmm. We're going to head on a little bit to the comic books. I'm not going to tell you about the comics because there have been several different comics published by several different companies, but IDW is still publishing an ongoing Ghostbuster comic right now. Yes. It's called Ghostbusters International, and it is a spinoff of their original Ghostbusters ongoing comic book called Ghostbusters that they started in 2011. They're very interesting. They kind of start after the two movies, and that's about it. Cool. That is the cobbling of the history of the Ghostbusters, everybody. I thought that you did a really good job. There you go. And you're probably, you're interested to watch the real Ghostbusters, right? I am. I'm actually interested to go back and watch that first one again. There you go. All right. So let's move on into recommended reading. Where we will recommend things for you to read. And you can find all of our recommendations at geekhistorylesson.com <laughs> slash recommended reading. And we are almost all the way through adding our entire catalog. Huzzah! Clicky, clicky. And it helps support the uh, Mayan University. Yes. Uh, instead of recommending the movies here, I thought I would recommend like behind the scenes books or things that would give you a different perspective on the Ghostbusters. Please. Uh, number one is Ghostbusters The Ultimate Visual History. It is a really cool picture book. You can see the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man suits, and it's mostly pictures of behind the scenes of making the original Ghostbusters. I flipped through it at a Barnes and Noble. It's a really great book, and it's a black book with a giant Ghostbusters logo. It's a, it would be like a beautiful coffee table book. Yep. Oh, by the way, I forgot to tell you a uh, fun fact in the recommended reading. Uh, Dan Aykroyd, the Ghostbusters logo is based on a sketch that Dan Aykroyd did on a napkin. I didn't know that. There you go. Yep. Uh, next for recommended reading is The Real Ghostbusters Omnibus Volume 1. Now, when The Real Ghostbusters uh, cartoon was out, they mm-hmm. made a complimentary comic book series. This is the companion to it. This is the first volume collects like the first 10 issues or so. It's great. If you want to know a little bit about the cartoon, and that cartoon has amazing designs. Cool. Uh, and then lastly for my recommended reading is Ghostbusters Volume 1. It's the hardcover of the IDW series by Eric Burnham. Like I said, I've read parts of it. There's allusions to John Belushi as the uh, Blues Brothers. Mm-hmm. The tape of marshmallow comes back. Uh, there's all kinds of stuff about Gozer. It's I've read it. It's a fun series, and it's kind of a neat idea. And they also do play with the idea of what if they franchise the Ghostbusters? Yeah. So there you foreshadowing. go. And there you go. That's my recommended reading. Great recommended reading. Let's move into discussion. Yes. Ashley, as a person who did not grow up with the Ghostbusters being around because I Ghostbusters 2 uh, was very early in your life and you yes. weren't cognizant when that movie was around. Oh, I was a baby. So the Ghostbusters legacy was kind of over by the time you started remembering stuff or, you know, it, it, it's insane yes. popularity. Yes. You know, because Extreme Ghostbusters wasn't popular enough to stay on the air beyond one season. Mm-hmm. What do you think is the legacy of the Ghostbusters? Like, is like, 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 and you can interpret that question however you want. Okay. Like, uh, I think I, I'll, I'll tell you what I think. I, I kind of have two answers for this, but they're sort of the same answer. I think that the legacy of the Ghostbusters is Stay Puft Marshmallow Man and Slimer. <laughs> and I'm gonna. Tell, I like your I'm, answers. I'm gonna tell you why. Because <laughs> even though um, I was not super into Ghostbusters, I always knew who Stay Puft Marshmallow Man was and who Slimer was. Okay. I did not know any of the names of the Ghostbusters. You didn't know Peter Venkman. I didn't. Oh. I did not until I saw the movie. Oh, yeah. um, Peter Venkman. And uh, and I didn't really know the plot or anything like that, even though I'd seen the cartoon. But I think that it took, it was one of, maybe not the first thing, but it, what it, what it has left us with is it has taken what was previously a very serious subject matter because like mysticism was a big deal basically up until the 1960s yeah. um, of like using Ouija boards to connect to the other side. It took that and it made it humorous and it presented it in a way that it wasn't scary. And I think that's a very powerful idea. And I think by taking those two characters, even though they are antagonistic characters, and making them kind of cute and kind of digestible. Yeah, yeah. It's always, even if they were bad guys, they've always seemed like they could be your friends. And I think that's the lasting legacy. And Slimer becomes your friend. He does. He yeah. does. Um, and the fact that now you still see in comic book shops everywhere, you still see merchandise being made of those two characters. Mm. Yes, now we are getting uh, some remakes of the actual Ghostbusters characters. Oh, the interesting have- thing I, was, I would say, I think I see more s- Slimers. Or no, I think I see more uh, Stay Puffs than I do Slimers now. Yes, and uh, uh, Funko just put out about six different Stay Puffs. There you go. So go buy them if you like that. But I think that's the lasting legacy. I think that if you are a writer or a film person or a mm. comedy person, I think that you can still look at that movie. You can still look at that original Ghostbusters movie, and there's a lot to be drawn from that. Yeah. But I really think that those two characters are the lasting legacy of the Ghostbusters. Yeah, and I would say in the, in the car. 
Yeah, and the logo because mm-hmm. I've I've never not seen the logo on a t shirt. Yeah, yeah, like just ever. always. You know, uh, that's that, those are some. That's an interesting perspective. I never thought about that, but I would agree with Thanks. you. Thanks. It, it's <laughs> Stay Puft and Slimer really are the true legacy and the logo. Yes. Uh, of, of of the and I count the logo with the car, but you know what I would say. I, I also think is the is the legacy of Ghostbusters Please? is the is the fact that I think before then you couldn't have made. A comedy movie with an actual serious plot. I would say that's yeah, that's a fair assertion. Because the Ghostbusters movie has a take out all the comedy, and that movie still works. It 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 you could make that movie without the comedy. Yes, with the world ending ramifications, it is a very serious subject matter mm-hmm. that they are addressing. Yeah, completely. And, and I think it, it it opened the door for some of these later. Uh, some that have done it very well, some that haven't done it very well of these like, like we have a legitimate adventure movie here, but it's comedy. Yeah, the action comedy. Yes, yes exactly. Or, or I mean, yeah. you don't get to Guardians of the Galaxy even without Ghostbusters. You don't. You don't. You don't get to any. Yeah, you, Guardians of the Galaxy does not exist or doesn't exist in the same tone. Yes. Without Ghostbusters. I totally agree with that. All right. Well, that, that's it. That's all I got for discussion, Ashley. That was a great question. Yeah. All right. Cool. Let's move into the teaching tweet. The teaching tweet where Professor Jason in 140 characters or less will condense his thoughts and tweet it to the Internet. Ghostbusters. If there's something strange in your neighborhood, who are you going to call? Hashtag the police. No, that's it. There is nothing else. I could never I could never write anything better. All I have to do is say that that that's the other part of the legacy. You know how people know like Luke I am your father. The song. Uh, um and uh, um you know and all live long and prosper. Mm-hmm. If you say who you're going to call Everybody says Ghostbusters. Can I tell a quick a quick aside? Sure. Uh, so growing up, I watched a cartoon called Hysterical Historia, which told you about um, history through funny cartoons. Okay. And they were doing a story about Teddy Roosevelt and how trustworthy he was. And he <laughs> led a brigade of American presidents called the Trustbusters. And they had a whole song to the Ghostbusters theme oh, really? song. Yeah. And it would go, who are you going to call? And they would bust out of the flag and go, Trustbusters. No, I didn't. I didn't get into this in, in into the pot in the main lesson, but there was a story that Ray Lewis, who wrote the Ghostbusters theme song, yes, um, he got sued by Huey Lewis in the news because Huey Lewis thought that he stole the melody. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. And there's an accusation that they're out there that that's very similar to a Huey Lewis song, and that Ray and then and then Ray Park just rewrote or uh, uh, rewrote the lyrics. Well, hey, Huey Lewis is just just uh, there you just go. jealous. All right, so that's it for our Ghostbusters podcast, guys. Don't forget that you can always find this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, and SoundCloud. And guys, if you go over to iTunes. You leave us a rating. You leave us a comment. Mm-hmm. It really helps other listeners, new listeners, find this podcast just like you. And sometimes we read your iTunes reviews on the show. Like Ooh. today, Brucey53 left us this review on iTunes. This is one of my favorite podcasts. The hosts are so funny and really keep you interested. You're welcome, Brucey53. Oh, thanks, Brucey. You're a sweetie. You know, Brucey51 was my favorite until today. Now, Brucey53. Well, they really stepped up. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and also, thank you to everybody that comes out there and suggests a lesson. If you wanted to suggest a future Geek History Lesson, where can they do that, Ashley? Well, you can do that at geekhistorylesson.com or facebook.com slash geekhistorylesson. There are several ways to contact us there. And we thank Sam Martinez, sorry, Martinez excuse me, for suggesting the idea of Ghostbusters. Woo! Don't forget to head over to patreon.com slash jawin, uh, where we're going to have more on Geek History Lesson Extra. That's exclusive to our Patreon listeners. Uh, we're going to pitch our ideas for what we thought Ghostbusters 3 should have been. Ooh, I love it. Yeah. So there you go. Thank you all for listening. I'm Jason Slime Your Face Inman. I am Ashley Victoria Robinson and Professor Jason for cobbling together such an entertaining lesson. Would you please dismiss the class? Bow, bow, bow. I ain't afraid of no ghosts.